Jeremy Corbyn comes from a place unlike any other Labour leader. He leads a party where his own MPs have voted against him twice. He's abandoned everything history tells us Labour must do to win. Yet the more the country's seen of him in this campaign, the more his appeal has seemed to grow. So what have we all missed about the Corbyn project? By day he's um, fighting to change the Labour Party and campaigning. And by evening, he's fighting to change the Labour Party and campaigning. That is, in effect, not just the end of Blairism, it's the end of Thatcherism. It's the end of an entire moment in British politics. Uh, his appeal is too wide and too deep to be ignored. Corbyn was born in 1949 and grew up in the small Shropshire village of Pave Lane. Other Labour leaders from comfortable upbringings, like Clement Attlee and Tony Blair, discovered their ideals after they left home. But Jeremy Corbyn emerged almost fully formed from his upbringing in rural Shropshire. I'm from a working class part of London. He's a very middle class person. And what struck me, he had quite a privileged background and upbringing. He'd got to grammar school. He didn't have the things of the inner city. But that's what he wanted for everyone else. His parents, David and Naomi, had met while campaigning for the Republicans during the Spanish Civil War. David was an official in the local Labour Party, and Corbyn joined the party before he came of age. The young Jeremy was often tasked with collecting members' subs on his bike. But it was at home where his politics were shaped. There was an atmosphere both in, in my house and indeed in Jeremy's house of the, the parents and the youngsters talking together quite seriously uh, about politics and being taken seriously, not being, not, not being patronised. Their first campaign was the 1964 election when Harold Wilson ended 13 years of Conservative rule. We did do things together, fundraising. It was in a marginal constituency of the Rekin, and it was worth getting out on the streets for. And that's what every party wants to know from its canvassing. It wants to pinpoint its supporters, to make sure that it can get everyone to the polls on October the 15th. He left his traditional school with only two E's at A-level, but thoroughly educated in politics. In an early example of activism, he'd refused to join the school's combined cadet force. Conscientious objectors like Corbyn were instead allowed to mow the lawns and foment rebellion. We uh, had a little room where we could disappear when we'd done all the jobs and make ourselves a cup of tea. And uh, it was, uh, uh, and indeed engage in further political discussion, because it was a time of great political discussion. But Vietnam, combined with Wilson's failure to really transform Britain, meant many on the left became disillusioned. By the time Corbyn moved to London in the 1970s, they had a theory. To fix Labour, its members needed to take over the party, to fight the leadership at every level. They blamed the mass media. On everything, from foreign policy to management of policing. And the Home Secretary had to reply to attacks on the police, like this one by a militant young delegate. If this government can find time and money, apparently, to appease the police, how is it they have not found the time to do anything to bring about democratic control of the police? You have to remember that on the left, at the end of the 1970s, our most important campaign was the campaign for Labour Party democracy. And the point about the campaign for Labour Party democracy was that it placed the most value on members and members' participation. That is why today, I think, Jeremy thinks correctly that his legitimacy comes from the fact that so many people join the party to support him. If you want to understand Jeremy Corbyn's professional life, you have to understand this particular patch of North London behind me. From Haringey to Hornsey to Islington, he's always been more of a movement man than a professional politician. As a union organiser in Haringey, then a councillor in Hornsey, and finally, in 1983, a safe seat in Islington North, his career covers the entirety of the labour movement in just four square miles. His guiding principle in all these roles the parliamentary party must bow to the party outside. Jeremy sees himself fir first and foremost accountable to the mass membership of the Labour Party and much less so to the parliamentary Labour Party and he sees them as having been over the last two years awkward, difficult, trying to undermine him, 
trying to obstruct uh, what he's been uh, trying to do. You have just seen the new Labour Party of Neil Kinnock. Glossy brochures, glossy words, glossy images. It all looks very comfortable and cosy, doesn't it? But when you look behind all the rosy covers, what do you find? Jeremy Corbyn, Labour candidate for Islington North. Defeat of the Tory government will be brought about by a series of disputes of which Parliament is only a part. The quote the Tories picked out was very important. Corbyn does see Westminster as only one front in a much bigger fight against conservatism. The hard left These positions were a gift to, to the Tories. This is Valerie Vaness, Labour candidate for Nuneaton. A Labour government has got to take on the people who obstruct it, arresting them if necessary. Arm the workers if necessary. Somebody said, oh Val, you're on the television. And that's when I first saw the poster. You know, I was on a poster with my friends, you know. I didn't, I just, I thought it was just ridiculous. Even in the febrile 1980s, Corbyn and his allies were well to the left. They believed in stronger trade unions, significant redistribution, and that power was won not just in Westminster, but on the streets. Their associations, too, offended Middle England. Corbyn embraced Martin McGuinness when he was still a pariah, and he campaigned for those convicted wrongly of pub bombings. Critics saw him as an advocate for the IRA, supporters as ahead of his time. It didn't work in 1987. Those people got elected. It didn't work. The Guildford Four were exonerated, along with the Birmingham Six, and there was a peace agreement in Ireland. So he was right, wasn't he? Mrs Thatcher is now edging towards an overall majority of 100. Majority the problem for Corbyn was, in the late 1980s, the country and the Labour Party thought he was wrong. And it's going to be a record-breaking night. Three uh, victories running for a Prime Minister. We're about to get... The Parliamentary Labour Party concluded for Labour to ever win again, it had to bury its Corbynite elements. In 1996, Tony Blair joked about the very idea of a Corbyn leadership, saying, you really don't have to worry about Jeremy Corbyn suddenly taking over. And in the resulting battle for the party's soul, New Labour's triumph seemed total. The message to the left, clear. We have been elected as New Labour and we will govern as New Labour. Jeremy Corbyn has always wanted one thing, uh, which is a, an ideologically pure Labour Party. Um, and if you think of it in terms of who, you, who, who are your opponents and who are your enemies, for Jeremy Corbyn, Theresa May is not his enemy, not his political enemy. She's his political opponent. His political enemies are in the Labour Party. It's people like me, people like Tony Blair, uh, and it's Blairism. Thank you, sir. Just like after Harold Wilson, Corbynism was born out of disillusionment with the Labour government. After the party's second defeat in 2015, changes to the party's rules for electing its leader, intended to revive the party's right, instead boosted the left. I thought he had no chance of winning in May 15, but convinced myself and others that if he fought a good populist campaign, he could get a decent share of the vote and use it to start building what he's always wanted, which is an extra parliamentary mass movement of progressive people. Under Corbyn, Labour membership has surged, and the Corbynites believe that a large base will keep the party on the left, preventing the compromises of the Wilson and Blair governments. A Labour party which was out of power but purged of new Labour voices, new Labour members, and new Labour influence is the ambition uh, of Jeremy Corbyn. Power is a byproduct because if you go to the root of what his supporters always talk about, it's, it's always framed in terms of changing the debate, moving uh, the terms on which we consider things here. It's not about winning power. All radical parties aim to change the language of politics. Clement Attlee in 1945. Margaret Thatcher in 1979. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. The Corbyn Project aims to shift the debate too. And this partly explains their defensiveness with the press. If you want to try and get good coverage, you want to try and get a you know, page lead in the Daily Mail, page lead in the Sun, uh, and work with the press, first of all, you, you genuinely have to compromise on your policies and your, your politics. And secondly, come a general election, as they did to Ed Miliband, they just throw the kitchen sink at you. So that compromise isn't worth it in the long run. 
let's be clear that it's been very hard for him to get over with a lot of the media all through the time of his his leadership plus another leadership election to get over what he's about now it's a genuine election and there's got to be some sort of fairness in the media even from the bbc the policies he's getting it over he's getting it over and the polls are narrowing any rise in support may be because Corbyn has compromised. Well, once he railed against appeasing the police, he's now a loud defender of the Met. He abandoned decades of Euroscepticism to hold on to the leadership and then switched back once the referendum was lost. Both those choices will form key planks of the leadership's next fight to remain in charge no matter the result on Thursday. A lot depends on, on, on June the 8th, but I think if, if he does better than Ed Miliband in terms of vote share, then he would be well within his rights to stay on as leader, having had only two years to try and change the Labour Party. Labour's performance in recent polls suggests that aim might be achieved. And so the project is this, to restructure Labour so party members pull the strings, for policy to be made by the grassroots, not by think tanks, for Labour to remain firmly on the left. That would all but guarantee Corbynism endures through this election and beyond.